Hi there. If you're a psychology major, then I'm sure you have heard more than once about the debate between nature versus nurture. Nature or nurture, nature or nurture. We're just going to cut to the chase here and say both nature and nurture shape the way that we perceive the world. So let's start with nature. Evolution was known about long before Charles Darwin, uh, but there wasn't a mechanism by which evolution could happen. We hadn't, that hadn't been proposed. So the idea of evolution, the idea that organisms, animals change over time, that wasn't a problem. But how did they change over time? Darwin's brilliance was in proposing natural selection. And what that means is uh, that nature essentially selects some traits over others. In other words, uh, the animal's ability, an animal's ability to survive and to reproduce depends upon how they interact with the environment. Are the, are the traits that they have um, conducive to a long life in their particular environment? And a great example of that is the peppered moth. Uh, the peppered moth started out, as you see in the top there, um, as peppered. It was a white moth with little sprinkles of uh, like pepper, black pepper on them. Um, but they evolved over the period of about 20 years into brown or dark moths. Why is it? Why did the pepper moth evolve away from its the description that its name had? Well, before the Industrial Revolution, 99% uh, of peppered moths were white and they blended in with the tree and the, the trees and any dark moths stood out. There was a lot more contrast with dark moths between them and the trees. And so if you didn't blend in with the trees, then birds would come along and eat you, right? If you stood out on the tree, it's like you're waving a big sign to a bird saying, come eat me. Okay. The Industrial Revolution happens. The Industrial Revolution is lots and lots of machinery now running, powered by coal, which produces dirt and soot. And in England, in, um, the environment got very dark and everything. You couldn't see the sun and there was soot, there was dirt all over everything. So now the trees that used to be light colored, now they're dark in color. So what does that mean for the pepper moth? Well, it used to be good to be light colored because you'd blend in with the trees, but now the trees are dark. So now the white moths are the ones that are getting eaten by the birds and the darker brown moths are the ones that are surviving. So the environment changed and so the, the moth evolved to keep up with the environment, right? So pepper moths are now black. They don't look like pepper anymore. Um, I've got some examples of giraffes here. Um, if you have a giraffe that is so short it cannot reach uh, the, where the food is up in the trees, then short giraffes will die off. That's evolution. Well, how does evolution shape our perception? Well, what is a baby like when they're just born? Helpless, right? A newborn baby is not like a, a colt that's born of a horse. It can't get up and walk around and feed itself. That doesn't work with humans. We are helpless. We're born helpless. We're born dependent on people. So the first thing we have to do when we're born is find people. How do we do that? Turns out newborn babies come into the world looking for faces, regular human faces. If you show them a face, they'll follow. If you show them um, all the parts of the face, but mixed up, so my mouth up here and my eyes over there, baby won't follow it. Or a face with no facial features, baby won't follow it. So people think, because there's no time for experience, that this tendency to look for human faces is something that is evolved um, to enable us to survive. That babies that didn't look for faces, that didn't look to connect with humans, died. 
and the babies who did look for faces, who did connect with um, other humans right away, survived. So evolution does shape perception. Well, okay, so do your experiences in life. It doesn't have to be one or the other. You can have both, nature and nurture. Um, and I'm going to give you an example of a video we'll watch here of uh, related to faces and the really important role that faces play in our lives. Remember, we're social animals and we're born dependent on other people. And frankly, our survival is largely dependent on other people. So other people's faces are really important and that changes the way we see the world. So let's watch that video. Searching for faces in clouds is a universal phenomenon and scientists say that there could be evolutionary reasons why humans experience this psychological wonder. Researchers call it parodelia, which is the false perception of seeing a non-existent face or pattern in everyday objects. They say that seeing human characteristics in non-living things was advantageous to our ancestors and helped them survive for a variety of reasons. Carl Sagan, a scientist that was specialized in a wide variety of subjects, theorized that babies are more likely to be cared for and have a better chance of survival if they can recognize a face. He reasoned that babies would be more likely to win the hearts of their parents if they were able to smile back at the faces they see. Sagan also thought this phenomenon could have helped protect ancestors from predators. By assuming they saw a face, even where there wasn't one, could have helped humans evolve to be more protective of themselves and their offspring and reduce the chance of encountering harm. What's that about? Experience-dependent plasticity. We talked about neuroplasticity before, and that is the ability of your brain to change. Experience-dependent plasticity just means experience changes your brain, okay? How do particular experiences change your brain? Well, faces are important, so that's one way, right? Our, the way we prioritize faces. But could you imagine growing up in a world where no one had a face? Well, we can't do that study. But back in the 70s, and this was before uh, animal testing was controlled in the way it is now, so this study could not be done now, but back in the 1970s, some scientists did some studies with kittens where they raised kittens in a world that either was only vertical lines or only horizontal lines. So imagine growing up, your world is entirely vertical lines or horizontal lines. What happens to your brain? Well, they found out with these kittens that the kittens who were reared in a world with only vertical lines had no neurons in their brains that responded horizontal. The brain had wired up to analyze only vertical lines. Conversely, the cats who are raised in a world uh, had only horizontal lines. They had lots of neurons that responded to horizontal lines and no neurons that responded to vertical lines. So that's a very concrete example of experience changing what you see because it literally shapes the way your brain evolves. Um, there is a similar kind of study that was done with humans. It wasn't about raising them in striped environments. It looked at um, children who were born blind. If you compare the visual cortex, all the visual areas in the uh, occipital lobe, if you compare them in adults who were born sighted or who were born blind, what does a visual cortex of a blind person look like? Well, it turns out that um, congenitally blind, blind from birth people have a visual cortex, but the amount, the number of neurons in that visual cortex is reduced, right? Fewer cells, they have a smaller visual system, people who were born congenitally blind. Here's another example of the role of experience in perception. Uh, we live in a world of buildings. So we see lots of vertical lines and horizontal lines, right? If you look at the background behind me, lots of picture frames of my family, 
vertical, horizontal lines. The only diagonal lines are maybe in this crazy shirt and in the pillows back there, but everything else horizontal and vertical. Turns out there's a phenomenon called the oblique effect. And oblique just means an orientation that is not vertical or horizontal. Oblique is a tilted, just means tilted. And it turns out that if you test people for how sensitive they are to lines, they're more sensitive to the presence of vertical lines and horizontal lines than they are to the oblique lines. Why is that? Well, it's because we have more neurons that respond to vertical and horizontal lines than we have neurons that respond to oblique lines. You can see this here in an fMRI study. Um, and if you look over on the right hand side, there are four blue lines. The links, the data in this study are plotted so that the length of the line gives you a measure of how many neurons responded when you were looking at a grid that was either vertical or horizontal or oblique. And what you can see is there's much more neural response, neural activity, when people are looking at horizontal lines and vertical lines than when they're looking at oblique lines. Right. So people assume this is a function of the fact that we grew up and live in environments with lots of vertical and horizontal lines. Now, it would be really interesting to do this study um, in people who lived in environments where there were not lots of horizontal and vertical lines. To my knowledge, that study hasn't been done yet, um, but if it has, correct me. I'd love to add it here. Okay. Experience also changes visual acuity. Now, there are um, lots of different ways in which your visual system can run into trouble. And one of them is, uh, the most common one actually in the US and Canada, is something called cataracts. And cataracts is when the lenses through which all the light you see goes, the lenses get cloudy. And that cloudiness means um, the stuff in the lens, it absorbs some of the light that's coming through. So people with cataracts don't see as well because less light actually gets to their retina. So cataracts um, results in blurry vision. Now, cataracts are easy to fix. They just take out the blurry lens and pop in a new clear artificial lens. Imagine the following scenario, which happens. Some children are born with cataracts and they're not able to have cataract surgery to get the clear artificial lens. So from the moment they're born, well, all, all babies are born with blurry vision, but these people have blurry vision, blurrier vision through their entire lives. Now, like I said, you can do the surgery and replace the lens. So Consider the following study. Um, you find children who've gotten to a certain age, I don't know, 10. They've always had cataracts, so they've only seen blurry vision. They've only had blurry experiences of the world. You take out the cataracts lens and you put in artificial lenses so that now they have clear vision, right? How does their brain react? Well, it turns out that um, People who have cataracts in childhood and then have the clear artificial lenses put in, their visual system, the brain isn't ready, can't handle that clear, crisp visual input. So they still see blurry, they still have blurry percepts of the world. Not because there's anything wrong with their eyes or their lens, but because their brain has adapted to a blurry world. So without detailed light, your visual cortex does not build the machinery that you need to see fine details. Uh, one more example of experience changing the way your visual cortex works. We've mentioned FFA, right? Fusiform face area. Those are cells in the lower part of the temporal lobe that care a whole lot about faces. And in fact, I've described them as that's their job, faces. But there's a lot of debate about that. Uh, so some really ingenious researchers thought, well, 
is it about faces or is it about expertise with seeing complex things? So faces are, are actually very complex. Uh, your ability to recognize your friends and differentiate strangers from people you've seen before depends on very subtle differences in the distance between eyes and nose shape and mouth and all of that. So let's get uh, a group of people and train them to make very small differences or to, to discriminate between um, entities that are complex, like faces, but aren't faces. And what these folks did was to create a world full of greebles. And these were uh, families of these little clay figurines and people trained for hours, undergraduates trained for hours, being able to differentiate and identify different figurines. And then they were put in an fMRI. And what you can see is that after training, um, while FFA still responded the most to faces, it also responds to greebles, making you think that, huh, people's experience with the greebles changed the way their FFA fired. Well, then they went back and said, well, you know, these greebles are sort of like faces. Let's find people who are experts, not with faces, but with other complex things. So what did they do? So smart. They found bird experts and car experts and stuck them in a magnet while they looked at faces, birds, or cars. And what did they find? When bird experts look at birds, their FFA fires. When car experts look at birds, their FFA couldn't care less. When car experts look at cars, their FFA fires, as it does with human faces. So experience, visual experience with birds and cars changed, rewired the brains of these individuals. So these are more examples of expertise changing perception. And so to wrap it all up, here's the bow on it. Here's a take home message. Your brain is always changing, right? Your brain is different now that you've watched this video than it was when you started this video. So uh, uh, your brain's constantly changing. Experience that you have in a particular field will change the neural processes that are involved in, or that are activated during your participation in that field. And just to sum it up, what you've experienced visually in the past literally shapes your visual machinery. What you've seen in the past influences what you will see in the future and how you'll interpret it. Wild, no? Okay, come back for one last video on perception.